Welcome everyone. Happy New Year. 2021 is fast underway, along with lots of activity in the job market. Millions of people across the nation have started new jobs, whether in a new company and some within their current company. And there are other folks that are gearing up for a job change. Now it's already mid-January, but there was still time to stop the madness and to set a course for succeeding in whatever role you're in or want. And that's why we're here today, for self-onboarding. And I'm going to add re-onboarding to that title because you'll be able to not only apply the strategies you hear today to your new role, but to re-energize your current role, even if you've been there for years. Absolutely be able to add these strategies to your toolkit for a future role. So I ask that you kind of stay tuned in, put your own thinking cap on and put questions in the chat box that are specific to your situation, right? So a quick introduction. This program is sponsored by Careers Advance, a private practice specializing in professional training and development. My name is Lisa Panarello. I'm the head of Careers Advance and I will be your host. And it was a question earlier, so I'll say this. I'm happy to say the program is being recorded, so you all receive a copy next week to review and share at your leisure. Right? And you can also see past program recordings on Careers Advance YouTube channel. Right? Okay, let's get a handle on what we're up against as new hires. Just some statistics that I wanted to share. 28% of companies polled nationwide have no official onboarding process. They literally wing it. And then 58% of existing onboarding programs actually just focus mainly on the process and the paperwork, not the people. Taking it a step further, 60% of companies admit that they do not set concrete goals and objectives for their new hires. And I think that's staggering. No wonder why nearly one third of new hires leave a job within the first six months. Now, here's the thing. We can place blame. Surely there are poor managers out there, overworked HR departments, companies that are out of touch or under resourced. We have firms that are scrambling to address all types of business challenges. But where does placing the blame get us? Really nowhere, I think. In fact, if we keep blaming HR and management and companies, we are just doomed to repeat the same onboarding experience in our next company. I say, take an active approach to your onboarding. And today we're going to focus on how to take ownership for what you can do to make that transition as successful as possible. So to get started, let's meet our panelists. Eunice Coleman. Eunice is an inspiring career, professional development and performance improvement coach. In her private practice of 20 years, she's worked with governmental, educational and nonprofit organizations and empowered professionals to, to overcome critical obstacles to their success, whether it be attitudes, behaviors and relationships. Previously, Eunice co-developed and delivered hundreds of HR, leadership, and management trainings at Prudential Financial and Merrill Lynch. And she provided high-impact coaching at Lee Hecht Harrison, the world's leading HR solutions partner. Eunice is certified minority women-owned business enterprise, and she's a member of SHRM. She holds a bachelor's degree in organizational behavior from Fairleigh Dickinson University and certifications in MRG's Leadership Effective Analysis, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and the Strong Interest Inventory. Fun fact, Eunice met Victor Cruz while doing a workshop at the New York Giants facility. Uh, Eunice, we will be talking about that experience later. <laughs> Next up, Anika Amy. Anika has been active in the field of training and education for over 20 years with a focus on professional leadership and youth development and performance improvement. Proficient in adult learning models, needs analysis, and workshop design and facilitation, Anika has delivered programs for numerous corporate, nonprofit, medical, and educational institutions on critical topics such as 
effective communication, workplace diversity, and employment readiness. She has a bachelor's degree in applied technology and performance improvement from the University of North Texas, and is a co-contributor of the You Can Make It to the Top publication. Interesting fact, Anika has presented to more than 20,000 high school and college students nationwide through her work with Monsters Making and Count organization, which is where she and I met. And last but certainly not least, Josh Hickok. Josh is the founder of Work Empowered. For the past 11 years, he's been a sought after career strategist, particularly for his unconventional approach to educating well-established professionals on how to become a better applicant and land desired opportunities. His broad industry and corporate hiring knowledge stems from more than nine years in the executive recruiting space, where he helped Novum Group Inc. become one of the top performing recruiting firms for Wells Fargo advisors and earned eight, earned, earned eight distinctions, including Rookie of the Year, Friend of Business, and Top Revenue Awards. Josh is certified in critical behavioral assessments, including DISC, Driving Forces, Soft Skills Companies, and Axiology. Key fact, Josh knows how to help folks get started the right way without falling into sort of new job traps. And I think that's a great segue. So let's tap into our panelist's brain. Now, granted, I have six particular questions that I'm going to be asking for our panelists. I'm encouraging you as we go through this, something comes up in your mind, throw it in the chat. I will take a look and I will throw, it in, uh, throw the question to our panelists and get your questions answered. All right. First question. How to prepare for week one. I've heard horror stories about the first week on the job. I didn't have email set up or access to technology. My boss wasn't even there. I was so bored from not having any assignments. Or I was anxious about leading meetings without any information. They didn't even in introduce me to my team. And these situations have been obviously increasing and compounded due to the whole remote work environment. So Eunice, I come to you first. What can a new hire do literally before day one? I mean, between accepting a job offer and coming to work to ensure a more effective first week on the job. Thanks, Lisa. The first thing I think of when I'm preparing people to help transition into a new job. The word is mindset. I want you to think about people first and technology and all the technical part of the work second. People first, why people? There's so much to learn, so many things I need to do. Well, think people because any of us, all of us are vulnerable before we walk into a new job. And I want you to think mindset and think about all of the things that you are vulnerable to, the things that you are unfamiliar with. You don't know the environment. So what do you need to do? Observe, be prepared to observe and learn. You don't know the personalities. So what do you need to do? Listen to them, get to know them and learn. You don't know the personalities, remember that. That's going to always be there. You don't know the boss's work style. We'll be talking about that probably later. Take notes and learn. And just remember, they don't know you. So you want to build relationships and gain credibility. Now, what about all those frustrations Lisa just mentioned? You go there, nothing's ready. That's frustrating. And I want you to think, mindset, Think before you speak, breathe, and know that, okay, what's most important for me? To learn the people, to really, really focus on those relationships and those other tasks. They're important, but who's going to help you find what's missing? People. So focus on those relationships, building those relationships, building rapport, and learning the culture that you've just walked into, the people, the politics, that's what the mindset. One more thing I'd add, and it's about managing your old role, especially if you've moved to a new role within the same company. You're going to have to set some boundaries because someone's going to expect you to do two jobs for a little too long if you haven't immediately replaced your old job. 
So you want to remember to set some boundaries as you go forth into your new job. And remember, the new job is a new role. Don't think that everything that made you successful in that last role is going to make you successful in this one, right? So take your time, breathe, mindset, and really step back and look at this new opportunity as just that, a new opportunity, opportunity to learn. That's great. I appreciate that. The mindset is a big thing going into there, almost expecting things are going <clears> to <throat> fall apart for the first week and <laughs> getting a little set of patience in, in that transition. Thank you. Uh, Anika, what can you add to that? What can a, a new hire do before they come in to day one to sort of make sure that that first week is going to be smooth? I had to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Great job, Eunice. Um, those were some great tips. I agree with everything that um, she said. And uh, what I would like to add is that I think, well, I know, especially in this um, culture and an environment that we're in with virtual um, working from home, remote working from home, I think we have to employ proactive leadership, um, definitely. And this is about just taking the time to plan and put measures in place to kind of prevent problems before they happen. Um, proactive leadership is just about identifying areas of risk and working on measures that are going to help reduce the impact. Um, stopping problems before they're happening altogether. So these are um, some tips that I want you to consider. Uh, four things. I think number one, um, you have to understand your expectations. Uh, again, be proactive, starting off with a meeting with your boss to understand the expectations for you and your role before you start, before day one. Clarifying those deliverables, timelines, specific deadlines. Ask how often you'll meet with your supervisor and whether or not you should schedule check-ins with them, you know, periodically. Mm -hmm. Again, being proactive, not making assumptions. Number two, not making assumptions. Asking, uh, you know, what time do people typically start working? How do they, when do they end their day? When should I be at my computer? Um, you know, ask your direct manager who will be the best person to answer your questions, especially if you know that they're not gonna be there or there's a, a chance that maybe they'll be out of pocket. Don't make assumptions about anything. The third thing, um, being hands-on, checking in with your manager or others as often as you can until you're hearing that you're doing it too much. <laughs> you know, I think just putting forth that effort to show them that, you know what, I am, here to work, I want to know what my job is, I want to know what my role is, it's more likely that people are going to wonder why you're not doing it than why you are doing it. And then the fourth thing, just ask, you know, especially if you're remote working, working remotely from home, you won't have those opportunities to, you know, have those encounters in the hallway to ask questions at the water cooler or at the coffee pot. But it's really, really important that you have to learn the norms, that you learn the norms or the culture or the do's or the don'ts of your workplace. So I want you to think through all of the things that you've picked up on being in an office setting in the past, in the first week or two that you were there, and explicitly ask those questions. So pull back from past experiences. What were some things that were lacking, that were missing, that you wish you had, or you wish you would have asked that first, that first day or that first week? Ask those questions beforehand. Mm -hmm. This is a way, also a way for you to shine because you're communicating to your new employer, hey, I really wanna be here, I care, I care about being part of the team, and I really wanna make those, that first week count. Um, these are some questions, I have some, you know, questions that you may wanna consider asking. You know, um, will my workspace be ready? <laughs> you, know, you know, will I have email ready? Will I have my equipment set up? Um, can I have a meet or greet? you know, the first week where I can actually meet with my managers or team members or colleagues or departments that, you know, the people that I'll interact with on a regular basis. Um, is there an org chart? Is there an organizational chart so that I can kind of see how the company is structured as a whole or, you know, something that can help me kind of navigate the new faces? Um, is there a company directory with a list of phone extensions or email addresses that I can have? Again, just try to think of all of those things that you might need that first day or that first week that maybe would not be readily available to you that can just make 
your first day, your first week, just run smoother. Being proactive, that is probably my biggest tip that I have for you guys, just anticipating what can go wrong, any type of risk, and how I can mitigate it. Yeah, you both really gave some good tips. It, it comes down to a little bit of preparation and, and the questions. So if I can just add to those questions, names and phone numbers, because if you don't have the technology to set up and you don't, and your boss is not out, who can you actually speak to? Definitely in HR. So uh, just summing up both your thoughts, mindset, questions. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So now let's say you survived week one. Now, I want to look a little more than surviving the weeks to follow with how to create a 30, 60, 90 day transition plan. Now, this phrase is is not foreign. I, I think we've all had, I think we've all heard that word, that phrase, and yet it seems to be used by presidents and C-suite, and mostly sales folks. I can think though that everyone, this is my opinion, that everyone can leverage a 90 day, 30, 60, 90 day planning approach at any level in any industry. I mean, it's the difference between waiting for your manager to guide you and taking responsibility for getting it done yourself. Now I'm gonna act as a panelists for a moment, because I'd like to share my umbrella strategy about the 30, 60, 90 day plan with some tactical highlights, and then ask our panel for their opinions. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, and you said this, Eunice, what made you successful in one role at one company may not make you successful in another. And this doesn't mean to leave your skills behind, but to recognize that when you start a new role, things are new and different. Now, there are, and I want to get onto my share screen here. There are three basic components to a 30, 60, 90 day transition plan. The first, what I will learn, then who I will meet, and then what will I achieve each month. And your first 90 days on the job, it should be about research and discovery, about strategizing and positioning yourself as well as execution and results. So your, your first month, you start small. You set yourself up to learn about processes and procedures, uh, meeting folks on your immediate team. And your achieving could be literally just assign, getting the assigned task done while setting up a solid work system for yourself. Next month, go deeper and broader. Extend your learning to identify issues and challenges. Extend your meeting to department heads. And then you could start extending your achieving to be maybe making suggestions for improvement. And I do say suggest here because you don't want to be a maverick yet because you are still new, right? And then third month, go even deeper and broader. With your learning, set yourself up to gather competitive intelligence, industry intelligence. People, start meeting industry thought leaders, new vendors and clients. And when it comes to achieving results, set your 90 day mark to actually have some metrics. I wanna reduce costs by X dollars, improve processing time by X days or secure X number of new clients. You obviously wanna make this relevant to your role. We have so many folks on this call from a variety of different industries. So consider what the metrics are relating to your role, right? You could even consider creating a, a physical plan with checklists like your own map to follow. Obviously you can add and remove and refine your plan as you go each week. But in my opinion, when you have a 30, 60, 90 day strategy plan, you will help yourself transition much more smoothly into your new role. And it can help you re-energize your existing role if you've been there for a while. And I can almost guarantee that it will lead to a much better performance review conversation. That's my thought. This is what I educate my clients on doing. I'm very passionate about this to set yourself up to success. Now I want to hear from our panel. Josh, what are your thoughts? Is this a strategy you would recommend or are folks just sort of at the mercy of a manager no matter what they do? Yeah, Lisa, I, I love it. I love it. And I think that, you know, the common theme 
um, you know, that I've heard from, from Eunice and Anika is that if you really leave your transition and onboarding up to you, you're, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. Um, and the stakes are just high, right? So to have just a degree of ownership over your transition and your onboarding um, and really pulling it towards you regardless of, you know, and maybe they have their act together, maybe they don't, but if you can do, you, know, you can follow the steps to, you know, to really make sure that, that you have a plan, you have a plan to understand what your expectations are, what your goals are, you, you have that communication uh, with your manager and the people around you of how you being there is going to make everything, you know, a bit better and cohesive. Um, so I think, I think having a plan and having it be, you know, at the forefront that it's important that I pull those conversations towards me, uh, regardless of whether they would have happened, you know, without me doing so or not. So I, I really, I, I love the, I love the plan. Um, and I like the, the ownership over, you know, making sure that you know that you're responsible for, for having a, a good transition, not necessarily the company is responsible. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of work, so it's very tactical, but you would do this for a client. You would do this approach for a project. So why not do it for your own success? So I, I'm, I'm uh, glad you're kind of on board with it. Um, Eunice. I am, sorry. I, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to quickly add. And then also just one thing that hasn't been mentioned is, is that a lot of times the, the onboarding not going well is compounded by the fact that, you, you know, it's cliche, but you only get one chance to make a first impression, right? So, you know, this is that, you know, the 30, 60, 90 days is where most people are going to form their opinions about you, right? And so um, it's, it's important that you, you know, you understand that and take advantage of that because you could be paying the price for something that didn't go well during the transition once you're, you know, quote unquote, kind of up and running. Uh, or, or the other, you know, the other side of that is true is if you pull it towards you and you, you know, you kind of endear yourself while asserting yourself to your new coworkers at the same time. Um, everybody will look and say, wow, this, this person's great. Yeah. I like that extra added insight. Eunice, what's your thoughts here? What would you add or remove or how would you complement this 30, 60, 90 day plan approach? Thanks, Lisa. I love this idea and I want to give you a perfect example of how if you implement this, it can help manage your expectations. Just this morning, I spoke with the manager of a client of mine who will be transitioning into a new role. And that's a luxury to be able to speak to the manager for me. But guess what? For you, it just tells me that it's really important to get the input of other people into your 30, 60, 90 day plan. This manager said to me, client is unfamiliar with this new, this section of the new role. She doesn't know that and she doesn't need to know the details of it. She can, if she gets to an overview in two to three months, that would be great. And when she said that, I thought that is so helpful because without knowing what's reasonable in two to three months, I know this client and I would be the same way. I would think I need to know everything in two weeks. So she gave us realistic expectations that she should have an overview, not a detailed understanding of this facet of her work. She just needs to oversee it. But in two to three months, she should get a good idea of this work. So this plan will help you manage your expectations, lower your anxiety about all of this new learning, because there is a lot of new learning. But understand, what do I need to know in 30 days? What is, more re what is a more reasonable goal in 60 days and what is reasonable and a, and a manageable expectation for 90? I love that add on. I, I, we're always thinking about, oh, managing other people's expectations and meeting other people's expectation. We kind of forget about us. And then you can actually have anxiety that I've got to achieve everything in a month and be a star in a month. And this does give that gradual uh, growth um, a reality check. So thank you. And Jill, I've got your question in my mind. I see it in the chat and we're going to get to that because that's definitely uh, connected to one of our next questions. So you hold tight for that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So you've survived week one. In a week or so, you've set up your 30, 60, 90 day plan. It could be a shell initially and then you'll add to it, get yourself set up and check in with it each month. Right. Then my next question, actually, my next two questions, I have 
I want to focus on a key component of the 90 day plan, which is people like you, Eunice, you said it's this the most important part. So let's focus on how to understand, get to know my new boss. I mean, getting a, a new boss can be nerve wracking. We know it. You're back at square one on the impression game, even if you've interacted with them at your current company before. So Anika, I'd like to ask you, what's the best way to get to know your new boss? You mentioned before their likes, their dislikes, their expectations. What's the best way to do that and set up a strong relationship with them from the start? Sure, sure. Um, I think the first thing that we have to do is we have to get those emotions under control. If we bring fear and intimidation and all of those emotions into the workplace, it bleeds through. It bleeds through. So the thing I want us to, to really think about is kind of getting out of our own head and kind of putting um, the energy into the other person. So what do I mean by that? The first thing, think about your boss's perspective. Think about your boss's perspective. Instead of focusing on um, the nerves and the energy that comes with, you know, this is a new, I want to make a good first impression, and this is someone I don't know, and will they like me? Think, put that energy more into, you know, I need to understand who my new boss is and how they are wired and what I need to do in order to make and work as a team and make the workplace better for us all. So this is the first step in that. Try thinking about what you'd want from a new employer if you were the supervisor. What is it that you'd want? And figure out the best ways to work with that new team. That's where emotional intelligence comes in. That's the key. So that's just the capacity to just manage your emotions. And so why is that important? Because getting a new boss and getting a new job can be nerve wracking, right? <laughs> so how do I manage that? You know, one of the tenets of emotional intelligence is empathy. And I don't mean empathy as in necessarily feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sorry for someone else. It's basically empathy is taking the focus off of yourself, getting the load off of your shoulder. It's not just about thinking about, uh, you know, other people's emotional makeup. It's considering others' feelings rather than our own, especially when making decisions. So there are three types of empathy. There's the cognitive empathy. That's what we're going to talk about. Emotional and compassionate. And cognitive empathy. That's where I want us to key in on. That's simply the art. It's an art of knowing how other people feel and what they might be thinking. And sometimes this is called perspective taking. Just taking things into perspective. Because we are working bosses are human beings just like us. So we need to think about that as we're going into the workplace. This is a human being, just like I'm a human being. I am a new employee. And so they may have just as much angst as you do about how you're going to fit into the workplace in that work environment. And you want to be able to work together as a team. We want to work together to make this as, as smooth of a transition as possible. So the second thing that we need to do is, you know, find out what his or her work style is. What makes them tick? So for example, do they come to the office early? Do they stay late? Do they do both? If so, what does that say about them and their work ethic, their work style? Does the boss like to be updated? How often? You know, is it by phone calls, face-to-face -face meetings, emails? What does he or she prefer? How often do they want to be updated with information? Do they like getting an overview of issues or projects? Or do they just want, you know, do they want detailed specifics? Do they want it succinct to the point? Or do they want, you know, just, you know, a bunch of detail? You these are things that we really have to understand. Um, what types of decisions do they want to be involved in? What are things that you can handle by yourself? Or what, they, what are things that they actually want, you know, some collaboration with? And take your feelings out of it. Take your feelings out of it, because oftentimes we bring probably more anxiety <laughs> to the table than what we need to. And I can just give you just a, a really, really quick example. You know, before I, um, before I got deep into training and development, I have a history in the medical field, and I worked with a lot of physicians. And I don't know if any of you have a medical background or if you're working, if you were ever used to working with physicians, but a lot of times they want things yesterday. <laughs> they want things quick and to the point. 
And I had to learn being someone who is a talker and a relational person and likes details, how to do that and realize, did you know what? Don't take that personally. This is a team effort. So if you get worked up about maybe um, a boss who has a working style that's maybe not your preference, then guess what? You're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you've made this more about you than about the team. So be willing to just go into the workplace with the mindset, an empathetic mindset. And this empathetic mindset is cognitive, just knowing how the other person ticks. I love what, that, Anika, really just flipping it around and throwing it to the other way and making it not about you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thank you. And you know, all the questions that you just mentioned, you can actually ask those questions. How much do you like to be updated and when yes. and so forth? That's how you can really get to know them. So I love that. Josh, I want you to help us with the next sort of level. Let's move up the chain a bit. Your boss's bosses, they may be intimidating. They may be hard to reach, but they're often critical to career mobility. So Josh, how can a new hire get to know their boss's boss in a meaningful way without crossing any boundaries? Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's interesting. There's a common theme here from, you know, all these conversations, which is to, to really get out of your head and, and over there with, with other people and what their concerns are. I think it's often contradictory where we think about how to advance in our career. Um, and you think, oh, ambition and things like that that are more of a selfish and focused on me kind of attitude. And I think that what you'll find is our most bosses' bosses um, they're typically there because they've learned to get out of their space and to empower others and to, you know, they're not going to get to that level unless they've demonstrated, um, you know, how to be an effective leader in the past. And so, um, you know, while this is true for a boss's boss or your boss or even a coworker, but really understanding what, what are they like, what, you know, just on, from a clear example, how are they measured? right? What is the company looking for out of them? What defines success for them? Um, and just showing a real commitment to, you know, where do you fit into that picture? You know, where do I fit into to that level of success? What's expected of me? Um, when you're coming from the mindset that like, how does this team shine? You know, what are your, whatever your boss's boss, whatever business unit you're in, if you're in a big company, um, you know, wh where is everybody pulling towards? What does that look like in terms of results? If you're always kind of interested in those questions and where you fit into that, um, I think that that's how you I think that's how you endear yourself to to everyone, but especially kind of your boss's bosses. Um, and also, coming from the standpoint is how did your actual boss win, right? What is your boss's boss kind of expecting out of your boss? What is how what are your boss what is your boss measured by, and how can you you know how can you be somebody that facilitates those good results? I think combining what you and Anika said about asking the questions, you can get that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the C-suite. Maybe start with their executive assistant if they have one, because those folks are gatekeepers. Get a sense of what they know about how that boss uh, operates and what they're looking to do and achieve, and, and then see if you can get a face-to-face -face with the C-suite, get some visibility. Even a 15-minute conversation can get you to have a uh, little visibility in the mark in the organization and then get some of that knowledge base. Love it. All right, so we kind of had some ideas there of how to set up a relationship with your boss and your boss's boss. Now let's look at everyone else because you obviously have to establish a rapport with your new colleagues, the folks that you work with on a, on a daily basis. And as a new hire, you could be seen as a threat or as another task for someone else to take on. I mean, you want to be a contributing member of the team, but too much too soon and you're a glory hog. Too little too late and you're seen as maybe lazy or indifferent. Well, Josh, keep us rolling here. How do you build rapport and credibility without overshadowing or annoying new coworkers, particularly in a remote environment? Yeah, I go back to Nika. I mean, this is uh, this is about this is where empathy comes in. It's it's really getting out of your agenda and your space, and and really, um, you know, you have a unique relationship with all your coworkers in some level, right? And so, really, especially as somebody just coming in, um, you know, asking them what they'd like to have out of that relationship, right? How how can you be supportive of them? What are they interested in? Where do where do they see their career going? you know, be somebody that asks a lot of questions and is genuinely interested in the other person's experience. 
um, I, I think is just that cool, you know, and, you know, that's an important part of, of onboarding and really endearing yourself um, and being able to kind of assert yourself in your role while endearing yourself to your coworkers is always kind of the balance I think you're looking for. Um, the other thing I'll put in is never gossip, right? Like I think that the people are on their, um, you know, they're on their defenses with people that they understand to be somebody that complains a lot about people behind their back. So, I mean, if you can always be somebody that, that tries to rise above that stuff, um, you know, and just, and just not really engage in that. I mean, not, not trying to make anybody else feel bad if they, if they want to gossip, but um, I just think that in a general sense, if you can just be somebody that, that people just know, Hey, I'm not going to get away with talking about somebody behind their back around. Um, everybody just tends to have a better feeling about that person. Yeah, staying away from that, kind of moving away from those conversations. Well, uh, Jill, your question kind of works in here right now. So, um, who did I want? Um, Anika, what do you, would you recommend, whether as a new hire, sort of one on one meet and greets with your team? And if so, what kind of, how would you manage that conversation? Sure. Yeah, that was one of um, my tips earlier. Um, the, I think that was the first question where we're talking about how to prepare for week one, just kind of anticipating being proactive and anticipating that, you know, especially in remote, you know, working that you don't have, you may not have the traditional, you know, being able to go by everyone's office and, you know, the whole introductory, you know, type of scenario, or it could be that you're, you know, doing, you, you are, you know, within the office and maybe they just don't do that. <laughs> but it's something that you would like to do. Just initiate, ask, ask the question, you know, can I have a meet and greet? You know, I know that this is, you know, kind of unusual, you know, work environment that we're in now, especially if you're working remotely and just, you know, you know, attest that, you know, this is kind of unusual. I'm working remotely, but I really want to get to know my fellow coworkers. Can I have a meet and greet? Can we do a Zoom call? Or is there some way that we can just have a conference call to where I can get to know them, you know, and they can kind of, you know, get to know something about me. We can exchange contact information and we can kind of break the ice because we're going to be working together and I really want to be a part of the team. I would 100% recommend it, 100%. You know, you're going to need people to reach out to. You're going to need, and that could even be something, you know, that you can ask your boss, you know, who are the people that I really need to, you know, be in contact with? Who are the people that are going to, you know, people that are vital to my role and my position here? You know, is there a way that I can have an, a formal and informal type of meeting with them so that we can all get to know each other since we're working together as a team? I really think that that's a, it's a great idea. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, making it human and reaching out and being assertive Absolutely. and asking questions, I think, is where you're all headed. It's kind of a common theme here. You know, if that's one takeaway, Absolutely. take it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I do see another question in the chat, and I, it's going to be covered, I think, in, a, in an upcoming question uh, that I'm going to ask. So hold on to that. If you got strategies now for transitioning it into your new job and building relationships, how about we go a little deeper and figuring out how do we adapt to the corporate culture while maintaining individuality? And I'm, I'm not talking about your hairstyle and the clothes that you wear. Let's go a little deeper here. I read a Forbes article recently and it mentioned that too many people in the workplace have stopped being thinkers because they've become conditioned to being doers. We know we have to do the work and achieve. And I've also read that some folks are feeling like headcount liability versus a valuable asset. So Eunice, I wanna get your thoughts. How can a new hire fit in with how the new corporate culture operates and yet find ways to bring your way to the table and be more than a, a job function filler? Thanks, Lisa. Um, I wanna begin, I guess at the, I'm looking at this in three ways, culture, climate, and then the individual. So I'll start at the individual level, which is who I'm usually working with, individuals. It's critical that everyone, whether you're internal or if you are in transition and you're looking to market yourself externally, it's critical that you understand your leadership brand or just what I used to call for people who aren't leaders, you, you brand. What distinguishes you from other people that do what you do, 
and know what you know. And if you don't understand that that is what you have got to get your arm around for the brand, you might get interviews, but you're not going to get chosen. You have to know what distinguishes you, what makes you you, what do you bring to the table? And I believe that once you really hone in on that, that's where I feel we gain our confidence. I think that's what the anchor is. You know what you bring and you bring it. So to that point, once you understand you, your brand or your leadership brand and what makes you uh, that, that value add and what makes you, you know, pertinent around there and then you can you can assert it i guess that's what i'm saying then you can assert it and you know what your value add is once you know that then you can contribute to what is the climate what's the climate the climate is more that that um What's, what's taking place on that team level? It's not culture yet. It's the climate that those people on the team, those leaders on the team create. And you, once you do everything we're talking about, building those relationships with peers and with your boss and your boss's boss, you start to understand that climate and then you can understand where you need to um, insert and assert your brand, where it's needed. Ultimately, that top level of culture, that's really, you know, the culture from any organization comes from the top. So that's the piece that I think we need to be aware of as we're joining an organization to know that that is a, a fit for you and what you can do with your individuality to, again, to forward the vision, the mission of that culture. But all three have to be a fit. I think we can do a lot of work learning about a culture before we get there, but what we really, really want to impact is that climate. And I think you can impact that climate when you know what your value, what your, what your, your brand is, what, how you can distinguish and what you can use. Um, I have one add-on thought to this because when I see culture, Lisa, I think about the struggle that people who are from diverse communities and understand when I say diverse, I'm thinking about people of color. I'm thinking about people with visible and, and, and non-visible uh, um, disabilities and anyone that feels that they're not quite a part of a group. I want to just assert that here we are in 2021, Things are opening up. People are working from home. We've gone through those, the, the, the struggles of, of, of inequities being exposed in 2020. So therefore, dot, 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 a lot of opportunities have been open. People are being seen. People are being heard that don't, weren't necessarily seen or heard before. So these issues that we're facing right now in 2021 and these opportunities that are showing themselves, it's giving, they're, they're becoming door openers for a lot of people. So you might get in the door, but still and only still, it's going to be that personal brand of yours that is going to sustain you. And that's true for everyone. You can get in, but what is going to sustain you and what's going to increase your movement, whether that movement is up, down, or sideways, it's going to be your connection to your brand. And what's a great, that's a table. great, great place, really, the brand. So knowing yourself, if you're going to assert your individuality and what you bring to the table, know what it is and what the language is. So anyone who's not quite sure may want to work with a coach or work with assessments to get some language around what your strengths are, what your challenges are, what you bring to the table so that you can assert it verbally and figure out where to do that. Um, Anika, let's, let's continue. What, what is your thoughts on how a new hire, a newbie, can uh, assimilate and yet still be their individual self and bring extra value to the organization? Yeah, I, I agree with Eunice 1000%. And even Josh uh, mentioned it. I think all three of us uh, are kind of on the same page when we just yeah. talk about just being assertive, you know, just asserting yourself. You were, and just understand, you were hired for a reason. Yes. You know, you were a candidate among maybe in some situations, hundreds of other candidates, but they saw something about you 
They looked at your resume. They saw your skill set. You went through an interview, maybe even a series of interviews. And they, you know, they looked at your, um, they probably were behavioral based interviews where they under, maybe asked questions to understand, you know, how you would behave in the workplace. And they chose you. So you bring those skill sets to the table. You bring that personality to the table. They had a chance to assess you, to figure out if you would be a good fit or not, and they chose you. Yeah. So understand that when you are asserting yourself, and I think that's the topic here, <laughs> is, I think it's kind of a, a kind of a common thread. When you are asserting yourself, a lot of times we cringe at that, but that's nothing to cringe at. Nothing, because assertiveness is, is just mutual respect. You know, it's a communication style where you understand or people understand that you respect yourself because you're willing to stand up for yourself and express your thoughts and your feelings, which is an awesome thing. It demonstrates that you're aware of others' rights and also how you and how you um, you want what you want to bring to the table to work on and resolve conflicts. You know, again, this brings a, a certain amount of emotional intelligence to the table again as well, you know, self-awareness assessing yourselves, you know, you know, am I the type of person that, express, you know, do I express my opinions or do I remain silent? You know, if you want that individuality in the workplace, you kind of have to look at, look within yourself and kind of see what you bring to the table. You know, do you ask for help or do you, you know, give other people, you know, uh, credit when they are, when they have a great idea, so they are willing to accept your ideas. And then also when you're bringing those things to the table, remember sometimes we've got to watch body language. We've got to watch all of the things that come along with our attitudes. You know, we're wanting, we've got a great idea and we really want to show, you know, our individualism within the workplace. We can't just bogart that, you know, there's things that we have to do, you know, watch, you know, use our I statements or, you know, instead of you statements, you know, all of the things that we've learned over the years, you know, you know, I agree rather than you're wrong or I would like to help with this. or this is the idea that I have, or, you know, other questions like, what do you think about this? Or have you considered maybe us doing it this way? This is what I was thinking. All of these things just are just little helpful hints, things that ways that you can kind of move in and integrate yourself within that culture without mowing anyone over. But yet you are asserting yourself. You are actually saying, hey, there's some skills. There's some things that I bring to the table that maybe you guys haven't considered. I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm present and I'm willing to come in and work as a team and, and uh, hopefully you guys will, can utilize these skills to make the workplace a better place, you know, better environment for all of us. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, again, what Eunice said, I piggyback off of that and Josh mentioned it earlier as well. You know, even if you have to, sometimes we have to even rehearse conversations. You know, if it's an idea that you have and you don't know how to be, rehearse it, you know, talk to a fellow coworker, somebody that you can trust and say, hey, how am I coming across? This is what I have to bring to the table. I'm kind of hesitant. I don't know if they'll accept it, but I don't want to come across too push pushy. How does this conversation sound? Right. You know? One of our uh, attendees here, Barbara, she actually kind of summed that up. The way you're saying is assertive is not aggressive. So you're not looking mm -hmm. to mow people over. So suggest of terminology and kind of all of what you're sharing is going back to your 30, 60, 90 day plan, your first few months are learning, listen, well, you're always going to listen, but definitely listening, learning, and then figure out where is the best place to assert your suggestion ideas. So um, yeah. the mindset and the tips that you guys are bringing out here is I think really very helpful. Now we've got about seven minutes left. So before I ask my last question, I just want to touch on <clears throat> one of the questions from our guest. Uh, she asked, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is there anything worth paying specific attention to when joining a startup? So Josh, Josh, maybe you can kind of touch on this for a quick uh, 30 seconds here. Startups have less people, less resources. So outside of everything that we've shared today, is there anything else you would add or folks that should think about when they're starting a small company, a startup? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, and obviously it's a big difference, right? It's, it's you can't get lost in the, <laughs> you're not gonna get lost in the shuffle when you're part of a startup. Everybody has to kind of wear different hats. Um, you know, so it's, it, uh, oftentimes it stretches everyone outside of their comfort zone a little bit because you have to, you're expanding your responsibilities beyond what maybe you're naturally suited to do. So I think that communication in, in that type of environment, getting really clear on, you know, what, what may be expected of you, um, and then, you know, and always kind of iterating, meaning, you know, if that didn't work, don't just don't pretend it didn't happen, right? Let's let's bring up what didn't work about that and, and try to put in um, something to kind of make that go better the next time around. But uh, yeah, I think just kind of communication, everybody being on the same page, um, 
as often as possible is, is really important in that type of environment. Yeah, I think a lot of what you all shared can apply in a variety of situations. So thanks for kind of summing that up. All right, so now we've kind of come full circle here. From starting to getting yourself up to success, creating a plan, getting to know folks, folks, excuse me. I, I want to ask this last question. How do you deliver beyond expectations without burning out? I mean, we know that there are a number of things that can lead to burnout impossible job requirements, isolation, excessive meetings, even work becoming more and more portable. So it's blurring the lines of work and home. So when you come into a new role, you certainly want to impress. But Josh, give us a minute here. What are some techniques that a new hire can use to ensure that they perform well, but that they don't overcommit or they really avoid some of that mental and physical exertion that we're all sort of in these days? Yeah, I think, I think making sure that you're creating the right expectations, right? And so when you're, when you're getting on board with what's expected of you in terms of your work product within the first week, first two weeks, first month, whatever it is, um, you know, make sure that you're addressing how that gets fulfilled upon, right? Not just, yeah, sure, I can get that done. And then you realize, well, that was a commitment that I wouldn't have made again, right? So game that fulfilling on that on that responsibility out a bit with your boss or whoever that is so that it it becomes hey is this realistic or is it not and then again i go back to um you know you really want to honor your word right honoring your word meaning that if you you want especially at the beginning right if you are in a new role if you commit to something you want to get that done and if you don't get it done you want to be the one that brings up that hey i i didn't get that done right i said i was going to do this it didn't work, you know, here's what I'm going to put in place the next go around so that that gets, that gets accomplished. I think that beyond like the amount of work that you get accomplished, being somebody that, that honors kind of their commitments and what they're going to be get done and, and how that, how you show up then as a coworker uh, or a subordinate or or whatever um, it, it just, it, it raises kind of the whole playing field for, for everybody. Um, and it, and, it, and when you are clear about, okay, I need, I need to do this and this in order to get it done. Uh, you're just not putting way too much pressure on yourself, right? People, when, when your boss or whoever starts to understand the scope of what would need to be done to accomplish that, they're not going to just pile that on you unnecessarily, but they will, they will, if you're just, you know, easily say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. And I'll do that too. You have to follow that up with, and how would you recommend I kind of go, you know, what are the spaces to go through to really accomplish that? When you start making them do the critical thinking as well as to kind of what it takes to fulfill on that, um, you, you know, you end up not burning yourself out. A lot of it has to do with perspective and the setup. So I, thanks for that, Josh. Eunice, why don't you kind of close us out here? What else can you add as a technique that folks can help them not burn out? Uh, thanks, Lisa. And to add to what Josh just said, I'm thinking about everything that we've covered. And what, when, when Josh said expectations, I thought 30, 60, 90 day plan, right? Going in with the right mindset. If we do these things, they will certainly, that, that 30, 60, 90 day plan will actually serve as a journal for you. So you can go back and revisit and do what Josh was just explaining of, seeing, okay, where did I overcommit? Where did I go wrong? So it really can serve as a journal for you. I just want to add some uh, time management, stress management tips. The two are highly correlated. So know your vulnerabilities. If you're, you know, if you're lacking in that time management area, it's always, I'll never forget a mentor of mine said when I was staying at Prudential, till six o'clock. And he said, you know, if the, you know, he named one of the VPs that got a, a, a chauffeured escort ride home. And he said to me, if he can leave at six o'clock, you can get out of here before six o'clock. Little Miss Eunice Long. That's what he said to me. You can get out of here before six o'clock. He said, if you learn to manage your time, it is a skill that you will be able to use for the rest of your life. Boom stays with me as if he said it yesterday. So you know who you are. Tighten up on that time management because it is highly correlated to your stress. 
a couple of tips, please keep in mind because it is stressful. But again, if you do, if you apply that 30, 60, 90 day plan, it should relieve some of, some of that pressure. If you assert yourself, right, it should relieve some of that pressure. One thing that will help, boundaries, especially working from home. It is blurred. I heard that word and I thought, there it is. The lines are blurred. So you need a start time and an end time. Make a start time and an end time. Stay up on your exercise, whatever that is, and do what you like to do. Don't do what somebody's telling you to do, mm. right? I'm strange. I like the treadmill. I'm not going outside, right? My husband can tell you that. I don't like the cold, but somebody's skiing in this group. Do what you like to do. Take care of yourself for balance, especially those first 90 days. Watch your diet, especially working from home. The refrigerator is just a small step away. And then also I'm going to say the movement. I hope when we're all finished with this call, we get up because this, this environment of working remotely has us sitting too long. So please start time, end time, exercise, diet, oh, sleep and movement. I think those things will help us along with everything that we've said today to reduce the anxiety and to celebrate when you get a new job. Celebrate. Don't forget the celebration. What a great way to end off sort of the both of you with the time management and the boundaries. And it's making me think of a, a workshop that a presentation I'm doing coming up about the power of saying no and how to assert your no in order to get the yes that you want. So I'll send that to everyone if you're able to join in. Well, wow, I, I can't believe it already. We've hit our hour mark. So there's just three things before we head out. First, I obviously want to sincerely thank our panelists, Anika, Eunice, and Josh, for your time, your insights, your generosity. And absolutely, I want to thank you, our audience, for participating here. You give us reason for being. Secondly, mark your calendars. I've got two new webinars coming up. On February 25th, I'll be hosting a Lean Into Conflict panel for strategies on navigating difficult and sensitive workplace conversations. And then on March 25th, I'm hosting a Managing Up and a cross panel for techniques on influencing change and managing folks who don't report to you, which <laughs> I'm sure happens all the time, right? And final thought, our conversation does not have to end here. I encourage you to, to network with our panel, with me, reach out to us for more information, share progress, just keep in touch. Because when we work together, everyone's mission is possible. See you all next time.